economics is a relatively new school of thought within economics, solidifying its footing in the discipline in the last three decades. It emerges at a time when there has been both significant progress and frustrating stagnation when it comes to ameliorating gender-based inequalities. On the bright side, research on women's economic vulnerabilities and their contribution to social welfare has finally started to receive the attention that it deserves, with an increasing number of scholars recognizing the importance of analyzing economic institutions, theories, and policies through a gendered lens as a means of striving for a more egalitarian society. In some countries, women have also made important political and economic strides that have advanced their autonomy, loosening the constricting shackles of things like economic vulnerability or atavistic traditions that have historically prevented them from living healthy and fulfilling lives. Unfortunately, however, there's not a single country on our planet that doesn't struggle with unaddressed patriarchal and even misogynistic ideologies and practices. Worldwide, for example, women are especially prone to economic hardship and poverty, have startling low rates of representation in politics, suffer from an epidemic of sexual assault and violence, and perform 75% of the world's unpaid household labor. Things like childcare, providing for the sick and elderly, or fetching household resources. Feminist economists argue that we can contextualize many of these gender injustices in terms of the ways that women have been denied participatory parity in the economy, both in terms of market work and in terms of the ways that their non-market work has been rendered undervalued and invisible. Unfortunately, the mainstream economics discipline lacks any theoretical nuance to effectively contribute to an analysis of the historical, institutional, and material causes of gender inequities and what can be done to ameliorate them. Instead, neoclassical economists depict the typical economic actor, commonly referred to as homo economicus, or economic man, as someone who is at their core driven to ceaselessly maximize their own pleasure or wealth, and who exists independent of social influence or obligation. For such an actor, behavior premised on things like solidarity, love, reciprocity, or morals would be unheard of, especially if it doesn't directly add to their own individual welfare. Mainstream economics also theoretically obviates the question of how power operates within social institutions to marginalize entire groups of people, instead positing that inequality surrounding categories like race or class are merely the outcome of rational decisions of each individual within that group. Furthermore, because market exchange is seen as being the paragon of human freedom, mainstream economists posit that if something doesn't have a price tag attached to it, it's irrelevant to any analysis of human well-being. To correct for these shortcomings of mainstream economics, and especially its blindness towards gender inequalities, we'd need a theory that is adequately prepared to deal with two very important facts about our economy today. Number one, the distribution of different types of economic activities continues to remain highly gendered. And number two, Capitalist society, like many societies before it, continues to largely take for granted the work that disproportionately falls on women, rendering its contribution to individual and social well-being largely invisible. And that's where feminist economics comes in. It's an approach that emphasizes the need for a gender-aware, inclusive, and even revolutionary approach to how we analyze the way economies operate. Feminist economists seek to dispel much of the value framework on which mainstream econ is founded. The idea that economic actors are inherently selfish, that power is distributed equally in the economy, that households behave in an altruistic or cooperative fashion, or that all economic exchanges are mutually beneficial, to name a few. Instead, feminist economics seeks to center how social markers such as race, gender, class, and nationality mediate our relationship to the economy. Now, I'm going to elaborate on two of the most prominent research themes within feminist economics. Our first theme relates to methodology, and in particular, using feminist insight 
to reframe the criteria for evaluating economic performance. As part of fighting back against the ways in which work that predominantly falls under women's domain has been rendered invisible and valueless, feminist economists have continually challenged what gets defined and measured as productive or economic. In 1988, Marilyn Waring published If Women Counted, a book that would go on to become one of the founding works of modern day feminist economics. In her book, Waring exhorted us to change our perceptions of what we define as economic and productive, arguing that the way that the economics discipline emphasizes profit making as the end all be all of what gets counted and analyzed significantly distorts our understanding of how successful a society is at providing for the needs of its members. Take the traditional and most widely used indicator that is used to summarize the state of the economy and well being. GDP. A country's GDP reflects the market value of all final goods and services produced in a given time period and is considered to be one of the most influential indicators when it comes to shaping economic policy and our understanding of the health of an economy. However, by definition, GDP only measures economic activity that takes place within the market, or in other words, if it has a price tag attached to it. And while consumption can indeed be indicative of an objective increase in living standards, it's inaccurate to assert that people derive a qualitative sense of well-being and meaning in their lives solely from the things that can be consumed. A lot of what we value, ecological sustainability, the preservation and promotion of culture, having meaningful relationships with friends and family, or living in societies that respect basic human rights, aren't for sale in the market. In conventional economics, This renders them virtually worthless when it comes to informing economic policy and measuring human progress. Waring's insights serve as an important lens through which we can understand various gender inequities in our contemporary society, and especially in terms of how the mainstream economics discipline and capitalism itself define and reward productive activity. From the standpoint of feminist economics, these incomplete accounting methods serve to institutionalize inequities across multiple demographics, including gender, race, and nationality, since many of the uncounted activities are undertaken disproportionately by marginalized groups like women, girls, and immigrants. In the mainstream economics discipline, this means that, as Maria Mize argues, Women's labor is considered a natural resource, freely available like air and water. It should not come as a surprise to us that, like our planet's ecology, when the contribution of women's labor to well-being goes unrecognized, it will be taken advantage of in ways that boost short-term profitability, but that in the long run threaten sustainable development, and even, as some have argued, life on Earth itself. While not everything can or should be valued by its exchange value alone, failing to include these activities and measurements of economic activity nevertheless leads to biased understandings of economic progress, particularly because many of these activities play an integral role in everything from economic development, the development of human capacities and skills, and the fostering of a society premised on sustainability, compassion, and reciprocity. In other words, socially meaningful activity that fosters well-being on both the individual and community levels. To correct for these imbalances, feminist economists have introduced new forms of measurements that seek to factor in the economic contributions and impacts of unpaid labor. One of the most important of these has been to impute a monetary value to the unpaid economic activities in order to measure their contributions to living standards. This can be done either through imputing the price that their paid equivalents fetch on the market, or by measuring the income that is foregone when one devotes time to unpaid labor rather than to paid labor in the market. Another way that feminist economists seek to measure the burden of unpaid labor is through time use surveys, which as the name implies, measures the different activities that individuals spend their time on. This is important not only because it can provide us with a breakdown of unpaid labor by gender, 
but it can also illuminate the incidence of something known as time poverty. Time poverty is based on the concept that in addition to needing monetary resources to attain a decent standard of living, individuals and households also need sufficient time to engage in household production, things like cooking, cleaning, and self-care. When one is time poor, it means that they lack the adequate time to engage in those activities that secure a given quality of life. These studies just go to show us how important it is that we accurately define and measure what we mean by economic activity, especially if we're concerned with identifying structural patterns of discrimination against vulnerable groups like women. 